Could I ask everybody to sit down? I'll introduce myself. Welcome. Let's come back in. My name is Arthur Zients. I'm the president of the Mind and Life Institute, and it's been a wonderful event. We've all just had the chance to not just witness, but also participate in, and uh, we're going to finish this, this day's work uh, with a panel discussion, which is actually going to be driven mostly by your questions posed to one or other of these panelists, but then they'll also be able to take up your questions together. We've really had a very rich set of presentations, both by the panelists who are here. I think you now know them all, so I won't take time by reintroducing everybody. Uh, but I'd like to go right to the questions I know many of you have been wanting to ask. Do we have microphones for people? They're being gotten, or are they down here? You got them already? There's Tom, okay. So let's just uh, open it up for comments and questions, particularly questions to those who are up here. There's a question uh, back in about halfway up, gentleman in the brown shirt, then I'll come down here. Hello, my name's Tucker from the University of Arizona. My question's about Dr. Holland's talk this morning on dissemination. What I was wondering about is there are certain uh, characteristics of good science, that it's uh, uh, conservatively interpreted, uh, that it's uh, detailed. And in dissemination, we're trying to move large groups of people to action. And the qualities of uh, persuasive arguments tend to be the opposite. They tend to uh, be emotional and uh, uh, conclusive. And I was wondering how you might all suggest for those of us who are coming into this field, uh, trying to balance those two. Trying to balance what two things? Uh, trying to balance on one hand uh, good science with on the other persuasive argumentation even though these often tend to be opposite qualities. Well, I think it all starts with good science if it, and that's why I made the strong point that we didn't really have much to go with until we were able to say this is now evidence-based and we indeed have treatment guidelines. So with that in place, I feel a little better about being trying to be more persuasive, but how do you do that then? This means getting to key people. Um, the, the tact we're taking is to try to train people in all of these oncology practices. Now that there's a stick saying you, you have to do this by 2015, we hope to get one or two people from various practices to come for training programs and then to be able to develop a network of people helping one another. So it's a kind of effort to organize and network in a way that we can get these points across. So, you know, a persuasive, persuasive ar argument by itself won't go very far, but I think that if you can get key people in key spots and get them then to start getting the, the word out in their own setting, so they'll be more believable than someone coming in from the outside. So it's a kind of stepwise progress, but it's a good question and I thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to speak to that question? All right. I think that one of the things with many of these interventions that you're, you're trying to roll out in the community or in, in workplaces, for example, require finding the right stakeholders and often a lot of persuasion, appealing to whatever it is that motivates them the most. So you have to bring the evidence to bear on the points that will matter to whoever is making the decision about putting a particular policy in place. And that will differ by different organizations, by different communities. Uh, so people tend not to be motivated necessarily just by knowing that something is going to be good. They're motivated by something that matters to them and, and appealing to that is, is I think important. Great, let's go over to the other side here, Jeff. Thanks. Um, His Holiness talked about a, a non-sectarian approach to uh, doing work and I know I heard him talking about uh, interest in bringing Hindu thought, um, Qigong as well. And so uh, have we thought about integrating in the different potential practices into studies that uh, you all are working on. I'm not trying to compete or compare one's better than the other, but actually just integrating them in, saying there could be the same application or the same result, or even together they might be better. Um, so could you talk about that in, in perspective and in work? Richard, I know it's hard to get an fMRI and do yoga, but. Well, uh, 
Um, I, uh, thank you for the question. It's an interesting and good question. I think that from my perspective, one of the really important things That's is the recognition is. that if, if you look at the dirty laundry of all our studies and look at the error bars, um, one of the things that you inevitably must conclude is that one size does not fit all. And uh, there are, there's a lot of variation in how individuals respond to the kinds of interventions that we've been talking about. And I think that um, one of the important goals for science as it's going forward in this area is to more um, specifically uh, study the relation between individual differences, what a person brings to the table, so to speak, and the kinds of contemplative inter interventions that may be most efficacious for that kind of person. Uh, there's a little bit in the contemplative traditions uh, that we can glean um, notions about that, um, but I think that we also need to approach it from a scientific perspective. And some of the methods that you describe may be more effective for certain kinds of people than for other kinds of people. And this is just something that we critically need to find out more about. Uh, and uh, there are, you know, a f I know of a few research efforts that have just recently been launched uh, where one of the byproducts of the work is to create a simple toolbox uh, that will enable uh, uh, a clinician, for example, to um, assess an individual's individual differences on a number of cognitive and affective characteristics so that um, the clinician can more uh, rationally prescribe, if you will, a particular kind of contemplative intervention based upon a real knowledge of those starting individual differences. Um, and, and a related point, if I could just add one other thing, one of the things we really don't know, and I think that this is a kind of knowledge that some groups probably have not wanted to know, which is that once people learn a particular practice, if you look a year, the, the, I'm talking now about beginners, if you look, for example, a year out, what percentage of them are still practicing regularly? Um, we really have preciously little data on that. And my suspicion is that a, a significant percentage of them are not continuing to practice, primarily because, or at least in part because, they may have started with a method that may not be optimally suited for them. Just, just uh, to add us to what Rishi said, Jeff, it's like, you know, for having been exposed to this scientific inquiry for almost like more than 12 years, I realized that there are many factors that you want to be sure to ascertain. First, you know, what over time, you know, how, if a practitioner has done 10,000 hours or 60,000 hours, what the differences are. And then, you know, the kind of practice, every single meditation has a different brain signature. I mean, attention, focus attention will be completely different from compassion. So it's already very complicated. I mean, if, even logistically, because you know you need at least 15 to 20 uh, long-term practitioners who have done 10 to 60,000 hours to bring them <laughs> from the Himalayas or from somewhere, you know, and bring them in the lab and then do all the studies. It takes years. I mean, and then the idea in the beginning was that let's hope that other labs will take the same uh, same task with Christian mystics, with Hindu yogis. Uh, with Zen, we even within Buddhism, with Zen meditators, with you know Samatha meditators, with Tibetan meditators, but then you have to do a complete, you know, regular study with each of those. Now the idea of bringing one Hindu practitioner with one Tibetan and then do them peace meditation compassion is just result in complete confusion, because then the first person experience will be quite different. And so I think the, the, the reason is, p is purely that there are very few uh, researchers from you know, 10 years ago were motivated enough to undertake those long studies. And those other ones are more than welcome, but it will require a serious, you know, extended, uh, long-term effort to make, have some kind of data that makes sense. So if I could, if I could just uh, follow up on both what Richie and Matthew said. Uh, we're now in year nine of our pilot study of a three-month <laughs> retreat. And um, I think it's very easy to say, uh, assess this practice or assess that practice. 
But the word, this practice, even within a given tradition, will differ as it's implemented within a single practitioner and between practitioners. So we report instructions, but we actually have very little data on the phenomenological side, the first person side, and its flux of change within the short term, near term, and long term. So um, it's, it's, these are early days for um, this kind of a um, comparison. And the comparison, I think what Richie said at the beginning, people are drawn to certain practices for very complex reasons which we barely understand. And so you can't really do a randomized design um, and really get a naturalistic observation of the consequences of these practices, particularly because of the other factors that we began to talk about in the session with His Holiness. I'm going to make a very brief comment from the Western mystical tradition of hypnosis. And that is, uh, th these comments are, are right on, and we uh, measure hypnotizability, many of us, not all of us do. It's about a, there's about a 0.6 correlation between treatment response with hypnosis for pain and treatment outcome. And we know that there are some people who are very responsive and some who aren't. And I think it would be wonderful to begin to, to look at the match, the overlap and lack of overlap with their use of other traditions like mindfulness as well. You want to say what point 0.6 means? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, the correlation, what it means is about a third of the variance in outcome is accounted for by hypnotizability. So you can make a pretty decent prediction of who's going to respond and who isn't. Uh, just knowing how hypnotizable they are, and we can measure that in five minutes. Great, thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Tish, did you have? Is all right? Gene? Yeah, I'll try you. Okay. <laughs> up here. Uh, Prepare for His Holiness. Okay. Yes, put your hand up right there, Tom. Third row. I don't think this this was mentioned. Um, but there was a lot of material covered. And this is, I think, more directed towards the medical sphere. And I didn't hear anything mentioned in this vein, but is it ever possible that a doctor or a therapist would walk into a room not having read anything about the patient and make a pure perception between yourself and that patient? because I work as a movement therapist, and I've done that with every patient. I don't read their medical history. I first make my contact, and I've had small miracles happen in that, because I'm not going in with a preconception, so I am not projecting onto them that already old story. And because of that, new things can happen. And I've seen it over and over again in very severe cases of people that everyone gave up on. And I just put that there because, you know, it's not a question, but it's, it's a, a reality. And I, I didn't hear that come up in any way. And I don't know that that ever is allowed in the medical field. Let's ask. Let's see. Anybody want to comment on this uh, suggestion? I, I think that <clears throat> that's a privilege that we don't have when we're working with someone who's physically ill. Where I come from, I would be very worried to go in and talk to someone if I didn't know a little bit about the nature of their illness, because I might say something that was way out of line with what their situation was. So the better prepared I am for what I may encounter, the better job I think I can do. It's very different. And if someone's physically healthy, I might risk that. But I wouldn't risk it with people who are physically ill, because it's they're too, too uh, easy to make a mistake. and and going in unprepared. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sick. I mean in this case, yeah. if I knew Jean, someone had I think cancer. We need to, need to get to that person that's up here. Okay. If you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Would you pass the mic back to Tom, and then we'll take the person who's uh, behind you, Tom? Where exactly? The Just person who's standing right there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mickey Lemley, and. Um, I know some of you have been interacting with His Holiness for many years, and I wondered if you could just say how those interactions have affected you personally and the direction of your work because of, uh, of that relationship. Richie, <laughs> <laughs> you're the longest standing. Uh, 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 
Well, there are so many things to say. I'm, uh, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, uh, you know, I think that many, many people who come in contact with His Holiness feel that uh, He really brings out the best in, in everyone. Uh, the very first time I met His Holiness in 1992, uh, I wasn't quite sure how I would begin the conversation. And while waiting, I was extremely anxious. And, and I'm not someone who's prone to excessive anxiety, but I, I nearly had a panic attack. And then within um, 15 seconds of being in His presence, it just completely dissipated. Uh, and I think that you know, uh, that's, many people have reported those kinds of things. Uh, uh, I also find that as a student of emotion, um, I'm struck by His Holiness's emotions. Uh, uh, and particularly, I'm struck by how extraordinarily rapid He makes transitions among emotions. I've seen Him cry uh, in sadness at some tragic news and then just like that, burst out laughing. Uh, and um, it's a quality which uh, I think um, one of the things that we study in the laboratory is this notion of, um, uh, for lack of a, a more technical term, we call stickiness. Uh, and stickiness refers to uh, the kind of spillover of emotion uh, uh, so that it colors the next moment uh, and uh, it, a person can get stuck in a kind of um, uh, affective perseveration, if you will. And there's a kind of fluidity uh, to uh, His Holiness that I think has affected many of us. Uh, uh, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's something you don't see very often in adults. Uh, you see it in infants in a certain way, but uh, uh, of course in infants you don't see it with the accompanying wisdom. Um, and so uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's really um, something that I have been touched by. And I guess I'll just end and then let others chime in that, um, uh, you know, I feel very much like my, um, my life and my career have been deeply touched and affected by my interactions with him, and I, I uh, have been uh, inspired to dedicate um, uh, as much time as possible to uh, work that I think will uh, help relieve suffering and be of some benefit. And uh, that um, motivation has only increased over time with the opportunities that we've had to interact with His Holiness. So uh, I, I just can't express enough gratitude for um, these precious opportunities. So thank you for that, Mickey. I might, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find the right word. Encouragement doesn't do it, but it's the closest I can come to. But, you know, you hear the results here is sort of all in a nice package, but I can assure you the path along the way has not been strewn with roses. Uh, I've been attacked for daring to put women who are dying of breast cancer together in the same room because I'll just demoralize them and make them worse. And many years ago, it was in the, I, I don't know, the 80s or 90s, I uh, presented to His Holiness and asked him why, from his perspective, he thought it might help rather than harm patients to have them confront death. And he said, I have a very busy travel schedule. And I thought, we're not communicating here, you know. And, and as you see, he speaks very good English. And, and he said, I, I get anxious about it. And when I do, I call over one of my assistants and he tells me what I'm doing for the next three days and I feel better. That's the way we Buddhists feel about death. We make it familiar and it becomes less frightening. So he got it exactly. And that was very encouraging to me because I was still dealing with a lot of people who knew, didn't just think, but knew that I was harming patients by doing what I was doing. And if I'm convinced of anything out of 40 years of doing this research, it's that it helps people to face mortality together. And uh, he gave me tremendous encouragement from this very different and, and very long tradition uh, to keep doing what I was doing. So I'm very grateful for that. Cliff? Yeah. So Richie would have uh, met the Dalai Lama in 1990 had not a medical situation in his family caused a particular moment where he could not go to Dharamsala on three weeks' notice. And he asked me to go in his stead. And my life was, has not been the same since that request. 
Um, this was for the third Mind and Life meeting. And um, what I found in uh, having this first close encounter with His Holiness was a quality of clarity and stability of attention in the presence of ongoing kindness that I'd never experienced in my life. Um, one could actually, I, this was my fantasy perhaps, but I, I could feel the ideas be held, be examined, and be situated, and then the communication continued. And the suppleness of that process really became a kind of touchstone for human potential for me. And um, the community of monks and teachers and um, lay people that were gathered uh, at, at that scene in that time was uh, quite magical. And rooming with Francisco Varela, it was really a, a combined um, uh, deep, deep opportunity for uh, growth. So we began uh, a project that actually gave rise to a field research project that Richie and Alan Wallace and others were involved in. The pictures of that have floated around over the years. And that became uh, the antecedents for the study that I actually presented here. So in many ways, uh, the combination of the dialogues with mind and life and the stream of research that emerged from it has been defining for my career. I was in graduate school at Einstein in neuroscience, and when I first got involved, I was uh, nearly screamed at by uh, my department chair. There are people dying of AIDS, and you're measuring the Dalai Lama's brain waves. I didn't have the presence of mind to say, well, part of why they were dying is because of their inability to deal with their own cravings for a situation that was completely preventable. So um, I think that there will be a thread throughout my life related to this. I'm going to, before I go to the next question, is there a Varela Award winner in the audience? Uh, I wonder if you, well, yeah, OK. We, got, we actually have quite a few. And I wonder if I might just ask two of you, Tish and, uh, is, is that Philip? Philip, uh, would you just make, maybe we'll start with you, Tish, down here, and then we'll bring the uh, mic to you, Philip. Who uh, the audience? Now let me explain just a little bit. The, the Varela Awards have been initiated by the Mind and Life Institute. Uh, anyone who's attended the Summer Research Institute, where about 150 of us gather together, many young scholars, uh, primarily young scholars, but also others, and then uh, if they've been recently attending, then they can apply for a fellowship, for an award, a modest sum of money, but has made a lot possible. So maybe you could say just a little bit about your own relationship, not so much to the Dalai Lama in this mm -hmm. case, but in a kind of second order you know, effect where, uh, Yeah, please. I think I'm a good example of that, actually. Um, when was the first award, 2004, 2005? Anybody remember? It was about nine years ago. So, so it was either 2004 or 2005. The I was issued in 2004, four. and the award was given out uh, toward the end of 2004, beginning of 2005. So I was in that first cohort, okay. and I was working on the Cultivating Emotional Balance Project at UCSF, uh, which is, I could go into it, but th my interest in that study was, can this mindfulness-based emotion skills training um, help improve student outcomes and improve classroom class uh, climate. Um, and so I got the Varela Award to look at, to do a little pilot study, to look at the teachers who were involved in the Cultivating Emotional Balance Project and observe their classrooms and see if there were any differences in the classrooms. And there was, you know, it was a pilot study. There was some suggestion of that. Um, I went on and did a bigger study with, a, with more funding. Um, but what we found in the second study what, of cultivating emotional balance, again, was that this emotion skills part of the program needed to be more contextualized. And I actually learned that from working with Paul Ekman, that the emotion skills needed to be targeted to the, the uh, stressors that existed in that context. So we developed a new program. I worked at the Garrison Institute. Uh, and we de developed a new program that we call Care for Teachers. 
And we've been developing that for a few years, and we've had two federal grants to study that program. First, we found that we did repeat the effects that we found on the teachers in the CEB project. We improved their well-being, you know, it's no, another talk, but we, we didn't have enough data to look at the classroom in that one because we didn't have enough money. Well, we just got, well, in January, we got a large grant from the Department of Education to do a cl cluster randomized controlled trial in the New York City schools. Um, and we're st we just finished our data collection in our first wave, and we're looking at teachers, classrooms, and kids. So um, we will have the end. I'm finally getting to that point, but this is, um, what, nine years, eight years later? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it was, a, it was a very good investment, and I'm very <laughs> grateful for, <laughs> for that start, head start. Maybe, maybe we'll do just one more, and uh, there are roughly 100 such awardees that, that, have been, uh, that have been received, and the, I think we've calculated something like $15 million of post uh, follow-on funding could be tracked back, and, and Tish is just an example of such a wonderful career. And they're now $5 million from you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, Philip, you want to just say a word about? Sure. Um, <laughs> Philippe Golden, Stanford University. Um, actually, it was really fundamental because that was, uh, I was there the first summer at Garrison, first um, Varela Award, and that, that actual award, ready for this, served as the basis over the last uh, several years for six grants, <laughs> more than $10 million, one, two, three, oh. four, R three R01s, R yeah, yeah, many different. And uh, now doing uh, cognitive behavioral therapy versus MBSR, compassion, vipassana, uh, chronic pain patients, social anxiety, 45 papers. Since How many papers? 45. 45 papers, okay. And many more coming. So that actually, it sounded like a little thing, the Varel Award, but in reality. It was $10,000, if I remember correctly. Is that right? In, in those days, I, I think, think it was 10,000, was yeah. it? Yeah, so that literally served as a basis for catapulting the last uh, nine years or whatever in, yep. at Stanford and translating that into, uh, and now I have a lab of like 15 people and higher meditation teachers <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, and also, not, but it's not only that, but also obviously, hopefully, hopefully, just serving as an inspiration for many younger people to see that they can go into this field and be successful at any level they want and that we can, don't have to rely on rich donors, but we can actually get the federal government, our tax money, and translate that back into research that makes a difference. That's a fabulous two examples. Um, you know, and, and, this is, and this is all in a field that didn't exist even 12 or 13 years ago, and I think it's just a, a testimony to the excitement which young people, especially young scholars, have come to this area with. And, uh, one can only imagine, we thought it was like 15 million overall between the two of you, <laughs> okay, we're already there, you know, so we're gonna have to change our figures. <laughs> but uh, forget the stock market, this is where you wanna put your money. <laughs> okay, let's go into the back just to, uh, I can't quite, there's a gentleman, yes, I can't quite make out who it is, but can we get a microphone here in the middle aisle? Is that possible? Okay. You Thank you. Name, um, I have two quick questions. Uh, one is for Dr. Davidson. I was wondering if maybe this was said, but I'm not sure if if there's any study that has looked at attention, purely attention regulation training, uh, whether that by itself leads to emotional regulation or not, um, without any other kind of compassion training attached to it. Um, my second question, uh, maybe for Matthew, is, um, you know, we all know people who um, can be quite unpleasant people for everybody around, but they can be quite satisfied and content themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, Personality disorders. And, and you know, there, there, I remember studies from years ago demonstrating that people who let out their aggression actually um, fare better in terms of parameters like blood pressure, hypertension, you know, um, than people who keep it in. Uh, but I'm curious to know if, 
how you know how you would think of that from a Buddhist perspective? Are is it really possible that there are people who somehow can make life miserable for everybody around them, <laughs> but can be healthy, <laughs> live long, and be quite uh, content themselves? Let's start with the second question, Matthew. Well, they are successful psychopaths. <laughs> this is well known. This has been studied. Yeah. They are all the characteristics of psychopaths, but they succeed. Very, they find a niche in this modern society to be quite successful. So the fact of being successful and in reasons is, uh, doesn't show you are a good human being. But you know, there are several criteria to your, to the flourishing of your spiritual practice if you have one. So maybe you are not speaking about meditators. First of all, you must somehow see the transformation slowly happening in yourself. You know, if you wake up one morning or after a meditation and say, no, I got it, you know, if universal compassion, and wait, wait for a few hours. <laughs> but if slowly, you know, like the harm of a, of a clock that moves, doesn't seem to move, but when you look from time to time, it has moved over the months and years, you see a change, so that's a good sign. The second thing is that, of course, there should be an interpersonal uh, object, uh, you know, validation of that. If you say, oh, my meditation is fantastic, and people say, well, he's such a pain, this guy, as <laughs> ever, something wrong with your practice. You have been wasting your time. And also, in the case of uh, you know, a real practitioner or long-term practitioner, there's a relation with a wise, compassionate teacher who can you know, uh, unmask your own projections and imagination about how great a practitioner you are. And sometimes the role of such a teacher would be to point out, you know, as however compassionate a person might be, who will be merciless for your fancies and your ego. There's no reason why you should be, you know, uh, uh, you say, um, polite with your, you know, what's not helping you to progress. Looks like we have a couple more. Yeah, so ju just on this point, w one of the other... Um, issues related to your question on that Matthew just addressed is sometimes um, people come to me and they say they really want to do research and they, they, they're not well funded, they have self-report instruments, that's all they have. I say, give it to their spouse. Um, give the questionnaires to their partners. Let the partners be the informants about who, how they're doing. And uh, rather than asking a person whether he or she is getting more compassionate with Whatever training they're getting, ask their spouse how they're doing. Um, that's where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, it's a way, a simple way to broaden the kind of evidence base. And, and unfortunately, we have um, uh, very little data of that kind at this point. A little bit, but not Just a lot. One, one image. We say it's very easy to be a good practitioner while you are sitting in the sun with a full belly. But it's when mating difficult circumstances that the practitioner is put on the scale. So, so just to follow up on what Richie just said. Is, um, You're on. In the Shamana project uh, with Baljinder Sadra and Susan Barawu, we're actually going to ask this, we're going to do this uh, second person perspective uh, project on the practitioners that we were assessing, uh, that I presented data, and now it's uh, six years since the data uh, will, has been collected. And we're going to be looking at a close other and someone one sees uh, frequently, but who's in a, a, a business acquaintance or a coworker or a colleague. And we're going to do that in terms of interviews as well as questionnaires. And so we're, we're going to have a robust second person perspective and actually be able to relate that specifically to the trajectories of change that the practitioners um, show. Yeah. There was the first question which had to do with attention. Yeah, so on the first question, the question was about whether attention training by itself produces emotional consequences, essentially. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the I'm not aware of any data explicitly on a non-contemplative kind of attention training um, that has systematically looked at the um, affective consequences of the attention training. There is some work on mindfulness practices that emphasize, I would say, the attentional component, but probably are not purely attentional where affective changes have been reported. And then there are studies 
where individuals go through a complex mixed intervention that includes both attention and affective components and um, uh, uh, scientists have looked at changes with that. But uh, uh, I think the question is a very interesting one. There, there, is, there are data um, though that bear on it looking at individual differences in certain parameters of attention and um, executive function like working memory capacity and looking at an individual's capacity to regulate their emotions. And there have been some studies which have reported relations between th these aspects of cognitive, individual differences in cognitive function and individual differences in aspects of emotion regulation with the, the basic notion that emotion regulation and cognitive control both may share some overlapping neural resources. I could just follow up briefly on that because there's some data from uh, the aging field that sort of reinforces that point. So I mentioned earlier this morning that there's a, a tendency as people get older to become more, uh, have better po emotional well-being and potentially regulate their emotions better. But in some work by Mara Mather and her colleagues, they found that it's only those older adults who show higher cognitive control measured through an attention task, typically, that are showing that pattern. Thank you. Why don't we come around, Mindy? Oh, you're gonna, let, let's go around up to the uh, top. I haven't gotten it, and I'll come back to you in just the next. Yeah. Up, keeps your hand up. There you go, right there. Yes, and then we'll come eventually way, way, way back. But um, Hello. I, I help to administer a leadership program for university students, um, and we merge contemplation and innovation for transformative social change. And one of the things that I'm wondering about is the process of healthy decision-making under stress. And so I'm interested in, in a lot of the work that was done around, excuse me, around stress, but also some of the work, uh, Dr. Nielsen, that you were just des describing, um, and wondering whether you can help me to understand and help us to understand how to make a practical application in this field, perhaps, of, of leadership and helping them to, tr to what, what science could we use to support the idea that healthy decision-making and contemplation and leadership are all kind of intertwined together. I don't know if I articulated that well enough. Well, I mean, I go ahead. Perhaps just remind uh, you of the, what I covered, but maybe rather rapidly. The studies I referred to on the um, enlarging the hippocampus with regular exercise were preceded by the same group. This is Arthur Kramer and colleagues at the University of Illinois, by a study of the effects of aerobic exercise on executive function, so decision making, showing that again an aerobic program is sort of like an hour a day for over a period of time for somebody who was normally more sedentary actually would enhance that executive function, the ability to stop one thing, move to another, cognitive flexibility, decision making, and would increase blood flow um, <clears throat> in the a number of areas, the cortex, prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, and so on. Um, which, and then it was followed later by the study I referred to on the, um, on the hippocampus uh, enlargement, and then, of course, as Liz Nielsen covered, the experience core study using, again, the prefrontal cortex showed, again, benefits. So physical activity, not becoming a marathon runner, but regular physical activity. I mean, some people have introduced the stand-up desk. You may have read about it, the treadmill. People just simply moving around. Don't go to the gym just in the morning or just in the evening, but move around during the day, which is very important. Um, so there are many aspects of physical activity that w can be incorporated into a person's life that seem to sort of loosen up the brain, plasticity-wise, so that other things can take hold. Thank you. Uh, I promised to come down here and then up there. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, this is my first uh, meeting at the Mind Life Institute, so I appreciate the opportunity to, to witness what's going on. Um, despite Philip's success in his grants, I see a bigger uh, issue with NIH funding. Um, limited funding, smaller scores needed for, um, uh, to, to support the work. 
Um, based on the 2007 review of the science of meditation, it looked like it was more of a scattershot of the studies that we're doing. With mind life as a specific entity working together, is there a strategy or a possibility of a strategy of outlining a matrix of studies that would be needed to actually fill in gaps, to actually put together the, the science of meditation in a way that would meet the meta-analysis requirements usually in science? Yeah, thank you for bringing up the meta-analysis question. Richie, this is probably needs to be thrown well, to you. I, Jeff, I think it's a wonderful suggestion, and <laughs> I would love to uh, enlist your help in uh, <laughs> taking you up on that. I mean, I think that it's um, uh, it's something that really needs to be done. And I, uh, while occasionally in our discussions uh, in various mind and life meetings, we've talked about things like that. We actually haven't taken it on as a project uh, of mind and life. And I think this is an example, uh, potentially, of something mind and life can do in partnership with um, one or more uh, NIH agencies, particularly the, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which is the agency within uh, NIH that is supporting uh, a fair amount of um, research related to meditation. So. Great, <laughs> thank you. Great, great. You know, um, just a comment. Uh, this was touched on before. Uh, you know, we, we've, I think, just opened up this, this resource of the contemplative life. And uh, it's a rich and varied uh, set of practices. And one can only expect that as one becomes more sophisticated, more discerning, like just as in the pharmaceutical industry, you know, there's no panacea we begin to realize that for particular individuals within particular contexts, working with particular kinds of necessities, health-wise, educationally, what have you, then particular kinds of practices will be generally better suited to them. And there may be a kind of ground state of, of uh, MBSR, which has a very powerful across-the-board kind of effect, uh, but there may be also targeted kinds of practices. And I think disaggregating, becoming more sophisticated in the way we uh, evaluate those practices and so on. All of that is, a, is something that needs to be done systematically. So uh, I think we're really at the beginning of all that, but Mind and Life hasn't taken that on. One last one on this side, I promised, and then we'll uh, go uh, from there. Okay, can you guys hear? Good, okay. Um, thank you all very much for all the knowledge um, that we've experienced today. I am a yoga teacher and a mother, and I, I found it very interesting that there's been a lot spoken to the child and then to those that are older. And I actually wonder exactly what we're talking about when we speak about older, um, because I work with a lot of people throughout the range. Um, and I think that, yeah, I've definitely seen and it's known that children are very responsive to change and open to change. and. I found in my work that definitely people who are sick um, and older are also um, open to change. And even if they're 55 or whatever it is, and I don't consider that necessarily older, <laughs> um, if they have par a terrible Parkinson's disease or something like that, again, they might be more open to change than your average normal person um, that may be looking for change um, uh, but kind of f is, uh, starts being open and then when they start to see the reality and confront the issues in the mirror and the ego, kind of have this adverse reaction and run. So is that enough of a concrete question to, to be answered? Question. Yeah, well, yeah, you have to be a little more specific about the question itself. So, okay, first of all, how would you address those that are between 30 and, let's say, 70 in terms of um, where they fit into these, these different sciences that, that you've been talking about, whether it's the emotional ability to change or on the scale of, you know, aging, how... Midlife uh, plasticity? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I can, so I think that the... 
the sort of categories of aging have changed as the population has gotten older. And what it means to be older can be sort of psychologically older, biologically older. I think biological age is more sort of the predictor of many of the psychological changes you see with aging. So when people realize they're coming close to their end of life, whether that's in your culture 55 or whether it's 95, I think then you might see the same sorts of psychological changes. In our culture, you know, we have these, these culturally um, marking points, like 65 is retirement age, and so some people tend to cluster older adults after that, and then we have the older old that have their own special issues. But the midlife period has tended not to be studied so much, and I think increasingly, whenever we at the National Institute on Aging uh, invite experts together for recommendations for research, they always say, um, uh, you need to start looking at this process of aging earlier in the lifespan. You need to start looking at the factors in people's midlife period that are impacting how they develop and what trajectories of aging they take. And even more so, people are pushing us even further back. So I think that there are special characteristics of the midlife period that are culturally defined because it's, it's rife with many responsibilities, both raising children as well as dealing with one's own aging and maybe aging parents that create, in our culture, special challenges. So aging, in a way, is both culturally defined, biologically defined, and these both will have impacts on the, the psychological and behavioral challenges people will face. Thank you. We can go over to this side over here on the opposite side. Uh, put your hand up, please, right on the aisle there, right next to you, Mindy. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I had a question, uh, I guess, for everyone on the panel as research scientists and educators and clinicians and practitioners. I was just curious what your thoughts are on what aspects specifically on this practice are having these effects. I know that a lot of the research is validating these very ancient practices, and I was curious on what your thoughts were on the specific aspects of the training or the specific aspects of the practice that are having these effects. Okay, so uh, trying to tease out specifically the magic ingredient, so to speak, of what, what part of the practice is, what aspect of the practice is effective. To quote His Holiness, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is, that's the research agenda. <laughs> no, I, more seriously, I, we, these are issues we're all thinking about and trying to study. It's, they're very tough problems. And uh, I, I, I think that anyone who, I, I, it's just an an, a question that we don't have an answer to really at this point in time. Okay, so, uh, still up on this side. Tom, right next to you on your left. Tom? We'll go to the first, you know, on that side, and then we'll go to the other side. Hi, I just wanted to thank you all for your work, and I, I was struck by some of the findings on gender today. So I wonder if some of the panelists, we heard from David Spiegel, Richie showed a slide that showed significant gender differences in early adversity and connectivity. And I'm just wondering, as the field of contemplative science moves forward, how might we be thinking about gender in this work, or how might some of you already be thinking about it? Who would like well, to take that? I can start. I, I think that it's a hugely important issue that we have not paid very much attention to. If you look at the research literature, um, for example, looking at the prevalence of uh, anxiety and depression, um, across development, you see that there are no gender differences until puberty. And once puberty occurs, those gender differences are dramatic. And the um, incidence of anxiety and depressive <coughs> symptoms in females is double that in males um, after puberty. And I think that um, this uh, uh, is an incredibly important fact and uh, uh, and offers, I think, a real opportunity for um, understanding more about first why um, uh, that occurs and um, secondly, to determine whether the um, preventative application of contemplative strategies earlier in development may ha help minimize that gender difference post-puberty. Um, we do not know the answer to that question now, and that's a, a tractable question, which I think um, is worthy of investigation. Yeah, Bruce. 
please. Uh, just from a sort of basic brain function perspective, um, we've been, I've been interested in sex differences and how they develop for a long time. One thing that's clear is that the brain, the entire brain, is a target of sex hormones through various mechanisms, and that both estrogens and androgens and even glucocorticoids produce effects on the brain that have, that have very, there are very subtle differences in the wiring of the, of the brain uh, that result in differences in how the male and female brain react to the environment. So it's a nature-nurture environment epigenetic question starting very early in life. The brain circuitry is subtly altered uh, and then the experiences build upon that. So the best way of thinking about sex differences in, in brain function and behavior, to quote colleague um, Peggy McCarthy at the University of Maryland, is that m men and women, males and females, do many, most of the same things with maybe slight differences in which gender is better at, and so on. But it's, they differ in the strategies that they use to do these because of these subtle differences that may be present all over the brain. And so when it comes then to applying it to something like we're talking about today, one has to realize that just as there are individual differences uh, for, among all of us, there are also perhaps are somewhat different tendencies among men and women and how they then deal with this, how they use this, how they respond to it. Right, great, but, thank you. Yeah. yeah. One, one, uh, one last one up. Be because I have primarily done support group work with women with breast cancer, I got interested in, I'm always asked, well, what about men? And they, you. you know, they also participate in groups, but they're much more agenda driven. You know, it's not, Mary, you look sad today. It's, we're supposed to be talking about emotions here and you're not. <laughs> um, it turns out in the studies Dr. Nielsen showed linking social support with health, there's a big gender difference. The kind of social support that is good for a man's survival is marriage. The kind of social support that's good for a woman's survival is not marriage. It's, <laughs> it's relationships with other women. So it leads me to the sad conclusion that having a relationship with a woman does your health a lot of good, regardless of your own gender. <laughs> <laughs> and having a relationship... <laughs> having a relationship with a man does your health no good at all, regardless of your own gender. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> So I think along with uh, Dr. McEwen's comments about effects of sex hormones on the brain, we need to understand more about the effects of social support and gender. You know, I think this is maybe a good segue. Uh, unfortunately, we have to begin to wrap up. A good segue We're to uh, <laughs> some final comments. You know, our, our banner for the, for the day is Next Steps. And uh, I wonder if I might ask the panel to speak to this question. All right, we've, we've spoken about work that has been done, some extraordinary results of your own life's work and questions drawing from the audience you indicate there also their engagement with these same issues. Uh, where do you see this field going? What are the, some next steps? Well, I, uh, you know, I would hope that, that um, some of the wisdom and experience here will percolate into the mainstream of medical practice. I hope that the idea that contemplating death and making it a part of your life is a good way to prepare for the rest of your life for successful aging will be something that medicine in the way we practice is, takes seriously. I would hope that we will understand more about how cognitive control and also the ability to change states of consciousness helps improve people's ability to manage stress and live their lives more fully. There's a wealth of information and wisdom that, that is here and available, but we have made very bad use of it in the way we treat people, and I hope that will change. Thank you. I Cliff? think that um, I want to hearken back to the first question of this session, which had to do with um, um, persuasion versus evidence. And I think it's important for people to also appeal to what really feels deeply true about the nature of their own life. And, you know, people uh, do heroic efforts in the absence of um, randomized controlled trials because of their own 
commitment. I mean, we don't actually have evidence if we didn't have scientists who, and practitioners and clinicians who had very strong hunches that this is the right way to go. The nature of science is uh, a rigorous commitment to one's perception of the truth because the truth doesn't exist as an objective reality. It's always a moving target. So I think it's really important to begin to pay attention from a research perspective to the other things that Al uh, was, uh, we began talking about with His Holiness. Because the meaning that you bring, the purpose, we had this repeated appearance of a sense of purpose in life. And that purpose could be widely manifold and it doesn't have to have a contemplative component. It could, you know, I'm going to garden and I have such a deep appreciation. This is your, your beholding um, term. There is so much that doesn't need to fit inside a box of meditation. And as we heard so beautifully from Matthew, meditation, qua meditation, dissolves into an effort of familiarization and cultivation. So maybe my little olive gardening is, is, is a, an appropriate metaphor. And then finally, I think this question of individual differences um, has got to be deeply <coughs> wrestled with. And there's an interface between um, promoting policy and appreciating individual differences. And that's a delicate balance. And I you know, leave that up to all of us and many more to, uh, to solve. Thank you, Cliff. Mathieu? Yeah, I, thought, I think there will be a few things that will happen, hopefully. First, more longitudinal studies. Of course, they, we are a bit impatient. I'm one of the first ones to be impatient to see results, you know, a few days after we went in the MRI machine. But both with long-term practitioners and then with people who have gone through the MBSR training and to the loving-kindness training for six months or whatever and see after quite a few years. And then in terms of the intervention, like in education, based on the secular ethics and the, which are informed, by the knowledge that comes from this collaboration between scientists and contemplatives, first they will be maybe able to refine more the kind of intervention that we, we can do, and then have a, as it's taken seriously as a valuable contribution, then we might be to extend the number of uh, uh, the, the size of the study and you know, on thousands and thousands of children to, to then it could really become a big contribution. And in, as you said, in the medical field, you know, introducing this notion that you could possibly, you know, train, uh, help to alleviate burnout, to loving kindness training, all this. I think slowly, uh, in all those fields, there are something that will be found to be really useful, and they hopefully might become mainstream, and while the basic research will continue. So that will be a good agenda. Richie. Uh, well, I think that um, th there are many important things on the agenda. Uh, there's a whole basic research component, uh, for example, looking at the impact of these practices on epigenetic processes, which we're um, just beginning to learn more about and, and use in, in human models. Um, and, and I think that we're going to learn a lot uh, from that over the next few years. On the more translational or applied side, uh, I think there's a real need for much larger sample size studies that are, um, will ultimately be much more convincing. And in the healthcare area, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about is the need for um, a very large scale study to look at the impact of the practice of the kinds of strat strategies that we've been discussing on healthcare utilization and on prescri prescription drug costs. Um, if we sh can show that the practice of meditation and the contemplative practices more generally result in a decrease in healthcare utilization, um, it will have, I think, very dramatic effects and very quickly. Uh, th those data, though, don't yet exist, and um, we need a very large multi-site study um, to collect those data, it needs to be done extremely well. Um, and I think it's going to be incredibly important. And, and if the data come out like some of us think they might, um, I think it will have enormous implications and, and be translated very, very quickly into policy.
policy. Uh, similarly, in the education area, I think we need large-scale studies that in addition to our um, uh, interesting experimental measures, we need to look at the bottom line that educators care about for better or for worse. Uh, and we know that uh, a cognate field, social and emotional learning, um, there, there are data showing in a recent meta-analysis from that involved uh, an aggregate of more than 280,000 school children across the United States, that social and emotional learning actually produces a significant robust gain on standardized test scores um, from interventions that are completely non-cognitive. Uh, and I think that if we had similar data for um, the application of contemplative practices in education, um, there w people will start to pay much more attention. And finally, let me just end by saying, I also think, and we, we started talking about this toward the end of this session with His Holiness, we need research on non-meditation-based contemplative practices, which um, don't exist. There, there literally is, I think, essentially no research on this. Um, for example, aspirations, uh, uh, which are very much a part of contemplative traditions. We don't know what the role of aspirations might be uh, in actually um, altering intentions and, and literally altering brain states which can have potentially salubrious effects. Um, uh, this is something that I think is totally tractable. It also is something that is very accessible to everyone because it potentially involves minimal practice and um, may actually make a difference. Great. Jimmy, we'll end with yes, you. I, I'd like to speak about where, where we're headed. I, I think that there is, just as there's a, a stigma about cancer, which is a little less than it was, there is an enormous stigma about anything mental. Uh, people think, oh, you think I'm crazy if you bring up, uh, you need some help. Um, the word psychiatric, the word mental is still frightening to people. And I think that that gets attached to whatever we've talked about here, the kind of interventions that we, we know are helpful. And so I'm all for more research, but it doesn't always, we can't, you do the research, you should think, you think they'd say, oh, wow, well, great, there's the data, we'll, we'll go use that. It doesn't happen because I think there are these attitudinal barriers. And I don't like to be crass, but I really think that we have to market this. I, I hate the word branding and marketing, but I've been trying to right. figure out what's the reason we can't get these points across. So I think that that's a piece of it, that the Mind and Life Institute could probably help enormously by, by focusing on this. Get a PR person in. How do we market this area? <laughs> That's what we've just done. And my goodness, they talk and they have a jargon all their own. And I'm learning uh, this area, but we're, we're, we don't know that kind of thing. Right. You know, we think we'll do the research and everything will be fine. It isn't. 30 years I've got of experience to tell you that I thought naively 30 years ago, well, if we do the research, that's all we have to do. You know, we show this works and everything will change. Wrong. So, and that's what, that's exactly, I think, what you're saying. <laughs> so, so I would say take a little different tact and use the institute. Also, if you can show something is cost effective. It's a crass world. Show you save money and they will buy it. That, that's, and we don't, our studies don't usually put cost in them. But it's a critical piece because that's, that's what will convince yeah. stakeholders. Listen, if you're looking for a job, I know just <laughs> <another question. laughs> I know nothing about this, but I'm trying to learn. <laughs> There's an organization in Cambridge, Mass. called Frameworks, which does exactly what you're talking about. I mentioned it to Richie. They are an advertising agency for good causes, and it's very important how you frame words and ideas for the broad yes. public and for policymakers. Um, is there anything else that you had? You, want, you raised your hand as if you I, wanted Yeah, to. I was just going to say, we used to be, have a put down for the things we're talking about to say, it's all in your head. But it is in your head. It's in your brain. And I think we've... Yeah. Let me just say a uh, first word of thanks to all of you for joining us for the whole day. Give us a round of applause. Thank you.
You know, and uh, one can't help but say uh, also that as far as we've come in these 15 years or 20 years, however long it's been, it's clear that we're just really at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, Aung San Suu Kyi was once asked, you know, do you believe in evil? And she, uh, echoing, I think, a Buddha, Buddha's teaching, said, no, I don't believe in evil, but I do believe in ignorance. Mm -hmm. I do believe in ignorance. And I think uh, science is there to dispel ignorance, but also these practices are there to really work to the root sources of suffering, which are, which are the mistaken conceptions we have of ourselves and our world. And so not only are these interventions, these contemplative practices, I think, of great therapeutic value, but they really allow us to do the kinds of deep research. I don't even call it basic, you know. I'll just call it deep research that allow us to really tackle the deepest sources of our misunderstandings about ourselves, about each other, and about our world. So I think we're really only at the beginning, and uh, some of that deepness is probably way down or way up, and we'll look forward to the next few decades of doing that work together. So thank you again for coming.